Uh, I have 10 minutes to do uh, from 1865 to yesterday, so we'll see how this goes. So hence, a very brief history of uh, this neighborhood. Um, I want to take you all the way back to the beginning, though, because the origin of this neighborhood is actually the origin of the non-native settlement of what we now call Vancouver. Uh, Hastings Sawmill, down on a seasonal uh, First Nations uh, camp, uh, both used by Soilutun, Squamish, Musqueam, the Saanich, the Cowichan, and the Stolo. And this was food gathering and fishing. But we also had the settlement of Gastown, 1870, uh, over here. And the seasonal clearing got used as a sawmill site in 1865. And so with the sawmill and the town site, the area then to the east uh, became development land. And what we have is the purchase in 1884 by the Oppenheimer brothers and a whole bunch of British Columbians uh, into a syndicate called the Vancouver Improvement Company, and they purchased the yellow parcel of land here. And that becomes Strathcona, Greenview, and a little bit of the Hastings Sunrise neighborhood. And everything else in the dark area for the downtown peninsula, and then on the southern shore in the big white area, that was the Canadian Pacific Railways land. So the Oppenheimers were the second largest landowners in this emerging city. And the Falls Creek Basin, which was really mud flats, but very important indigenous fishing grounds, as well as a connection of spring water that goes all the way back out to Burnaby and Burnaby Lakes. There's an underground stream that emerged in the center there. Uh, and there is an indigenous term for the Eastern Basin based on that spring. Uh, but there was fishing. There was also what were early survey notebooks noted on a point of land at the foot of Princess, a so-called medicine ditch, which was actually an early sweat lodge. And so there's a lot of indigenous use in fishing camps around the basin. But by 1909, the city held a public public site. Citizens voted to sell it to the railways, and it was uh, filled from 1909 through to 1919, creating the flats that we actually have today. And that's David Oppenheimer, second baron. He was the guy that, uh, along with his business partners, owned everything. Uh, what we have is the biggest change for the neighborhood. We're jumping now from 1886 right through to 1927 because the biggest impact on this neighborhood after two phases of development, 18, uh, 1886 through to 1893, and then there was a depression, 1897 to 1913, and then there was a depression, and then just sort of incremental filling in of the neighborhood with houses. But 1927, the neighborhood got rezoned in the plan that creates the modern city of Vancouver, the amalgamation of three, uh, Point Grey, South Vancouver and Vancouver, and the Strathcona neighborhood, still called the East End, then is zoned for industry. And that then leads directly to all of the issues that we now deal with, because industrial land, it's hard to get a mortgage, it's hard to get to permits for home repair. And that leads to scenes like this, uh, looking just off, uh, the back end of Stamps Place uh, in the 1960s, uh, industrial warehouses, there was actually a couple of slaughterhouses on Raymer and uh, BC Sugar at the end of the street. And then you had 1947, and Leonard Marsh, who uh, from Ontario got a position out at UBC as a social planner, wrote a report about the East End, about how it should be redeveloped. And he used photographs like this, kids playing in the street things that we strive for in communities today. <laughs> well, that led to delinquency, according to him. Uh, this is actually Campbell Avenue, we're looking north, and uh, Stamps Place takes up uh, a good chunk of this photograph. But kids playing on the street, and Prior Street, this nasty road of trucks and houses too close to the street. And of course, on the right-hand side is the garbage dump, which is, of course, uh, today's Strathcona Gardens and the Park which you will know on the far side there are the apartment buildings because much of the park was actually built on with housing and uh, various other things. And everything on the other side actually still exists today, but there is Prior Street. And this is Leonard's plan for the neighborhood. And so uh, based on that industrial zoning, he felt that the neighborhood couldn't be rescued. It was just, well, the houses were too close together. People played in the street. They were old houses. There was yada, 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 yada. So this was his plan for the neighborhood, basically knock it down and rebuild it. What's missing is any of the large freeways that uh, later come. But this plan was then rewritten by the city of Vancouver in the late 1950s and formed the basis of the urban renewal projects that uh, this, the neighborhood successfully fought against. This is the city's project, and you'll see the complete reorganization and the deceptive large 
fields of green colored pencil on this map. Uh, this was actually large, very dense, but there was a central sort of playground. And then at the bottom is we see penciled in uh, the first note of a highway and freeway running through the east side of the city. And then the purple is all industry, and so they were moving it out of the neighborhood, but wholesale destruction of the neighborhood itself. And that leads from that industrial zoning because uh, they felt the neighborhood was too rough around the edges to save. And there was also that connotation of the East End, and they produced a delinquents map, and they showed you know, more delinquents in Strathcona versus Point Grey and all that kind of stuff. And so the neighborhood itself, uh, Stamps Place, is just under construction on the right-hand side uh, there. Uh, the houses still jammed together, but as Stamps is under construction, McLean Park is finished, the neighborhood rises up and uh, says no to the urban renewal for many different reasons, but one of the prime ones was the expropriation rates. Houses were worth 8,000 bucks back then. The city was knocking on doors offering checks of 4,000, and the residents said no. And there was also the ugly word, the R word in here, because this, by the 1950s, was about a neighborhood of about 60 to 75 percent Chinese residents after immigration restrictions lifted in the 1940s. But what the city was trying to do was break the economic relationship between the neighborhood and Chinatown. And so as they demolished houses, residents found themselves living at Skeena Terrace, Boundary Road and Broadway. And the promised return to the neighborhood for many of them didn't actually happen. So the existing residents complained about the new residents being put into the housing. Where's our friends? So we had a huge uprising within the neighborhood led by a number of uh, community residents that creates the Strathcona Property Owners and Tenants Association, put, pushes back on the urban renewal. It's canned and canceled. The city, though, did try to keep it going long after all the other funding partners had disappeared. Uh, and then it did collapse on its own uh, weight and opposition. But coming into that is separate from the urban renewal was the freeway plan. And so the neighborhood was under threat by the freeway. And I put this in because what we're seeing here is the relatively new, this is the early 1960s, we're seeing the relatively new connection between Venables and Prior Street, so that's that little loop thing. And the dirt track that you see that runs straight off of Venables is the old BC Electric right-of-way. The young <coughs> urbans used to run down Campbell and turn and go up Venables to Commercial Drive. And this is Villa Cafe, the cafe, the Chinese seniors home uh, ground right there now. And so this is a relatively recent connection, but everything from that BC Electric right-of-way and all of those houses between Prior and Union, that was the freeway route. And so when you come off the viaducts, they take that sharp turn down prior. But just before you take that sharp turn, look, and that was the vista of where the road was supposed to go. And so residents across the city, and Strathcona, Grandview, etc., worked tirelessly to defeat uh, the freeway program. And that's what ended up happening. And so that's where we are today with this rather awkward situation on prior with lots of traffic and um, the kind of wonky sort of connections and things like that. The park is interesting because it is actually Great Northern Railway lands, but they defaulted on their taxes and ended up giving the land in lieu of taxes to the city. The city used a chunk of it as a garbage dump. They did formalize the park at one corner, and the Strathcona Community Gardens was used as a dump right through into uh, the 1950s. And so there was actually some open water uh, just off the edge of the Strathcona Community Gardens in the 1960s and 70s that never got filled from the creek. So, the park itself was just a large chunk of grass uh, and some odd little bits and pieces for many, many years. Uh, here's the freeway plan, just to give you the sense of yikes and scale of how bad this thing would have been. And the spaghetti junction that hits right at Main Street uh, in there is vaguely discernible, the two little bits of the viaducts that were actually built. And I just wanted to end on these things. Strathcona Park has had many, many different uses at that back end of the park. And uh, years ago, I was doing a talk about Strathcona and somebody in the audience said, I'll send you some photos. I said, okay. He says, you didn't know there was car racing there, did you? <laughs> so that funny little wreck of a piece of asphalt at the back end next to Cottonwood isn't actually a running track. It's the remnants of the asphalt of the car racing track here. And there's general paint up in the background there. So. The park itself over many years has had quite an interesting transition 
And the cars didn't last that long, but it was a car racing track for a number of years. And behind it, of course, is Produce Row. And I think one of the interesting and important things to keep in mind is while we talk about Produce Row, if we go back into the urban renewal and the freeway fights, Produce Row was centered partly in Gaston on Water Street. That was wholesale fruits and vegetables like Malkin. But Union and East Georgia Streets in Chinatown was the center of fresh fruit and produce distribution in Vancouver. 60 to 70 percent of fresh fruits and vegetables came from Chinese produce dealers. The reason they're on Malkin, they got pushed off of Union and Pryor and East Georgia because of urban renewal and potential freeways. So we come around in full circle again. Here we are. Done. Thank you, John, very much. Um, next, we're going to invite our next uh, speaker up, who is going to bring you uh, to present. Uh, Tom Wanklin will be speaking. Um, and we joined briefly by Doug, who you met for one question earlier. So, um, as we get things ready to roll, we'll I'll step away and let Tom get situated. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for this opportunity uh, to take you through a little bit. Uh, I'll call it a snapshot, really, of the, the neighborhoods in and around uh, the flats. Um, many of you are aware of the relationship. We've been talking about the relationship between uh, downtown east side, which has a number of neighborhoods, seven in all skirting the north of the flats, and then Grandview Woodlands, of course, Mount Pleasant to the south, and then City Gate and uh, Olympic Village in the west. From a, a data point of view, oh, what about that? Can somebody help me with the next slide? I'm not sure why the, is it the battery? Oh, it did. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Just very briefly, downtown east side has about 19,600 residents now, and about 23,000 people work in that neighborhood or those neighborhoods every day. Um, if you look at uh, the relationship to Grandview Woodlands to the east, also a very mixed uh, neighborhood with residences and commercial drive forming a very important employment arc uh, uh, corridor. Falls Creek Flats to the south of downtown east side, uh, very few people living in the flats, but mostly 8,000, approximately 8,000 jobs in some 600 businesses. Um, and then looking at the resident population around the flats, Within five minutes walking at the moment, you have about 20,000 people. Uh, within 10 minutes walk of the flats, you have some 50 odd thousand people. And by 2041, we see that growing to about 100,000 people. It's interesting also by 2041, we, 2040, we anticipate that half a million people will be able to connect to the flats and through the flats mainly through transit and the arterial road network as the city around us grows and goes forward in the future. Businesses, the economic sectors in the downtown east side, it's changing from one area that was, as John said, predominantly a manufacturing industrial base to now a professional scientific being the, the largest number of jobs um, retail, accommodation, hospitality, and then other services and various agencies serving the, the local community. As I mentioned, 20 odd thousand people working in there. If you look at the flats, it's also in transition. Uh, you have a large number of wholesale, retail, and uh, service type uses in the flats. It's an incredibly important artists, studio, and manufacturing neighborhood. Some 40% of the artist studios of the city are located in and around the flats. And then, of course, Produce Row um, is a unique use, which is of uh, regional and even uh, greater provincial significance with the 
resupply of fresh produce and other um, goods to our restaurants, our retailers, and even uh, helicoptered up to cruise liners uh, in Alaska, for example. Extremely important to us. If you look at the distribution of employment lands in the city, it's those dark blue and slightly green patches. It's only 10% of the city is to, dedicated to zoned mixed employment and industrial uses. So it's very, very precious. And interestingly, that 10% employs 50% of our workforce. In that area as well, in the flats, we also have city-owned properties. You look at all of the blue uh, or purplish color properties in, in, in your area of study, and those are all city-owned. They're not vacant. They're mostly um, used and developed. Um, in and around the flats, you'll see there's the orange railway-owned land, which Long, and, uh, Long talked about earlier. So there's a substantial amount of land allocated for uh, city purposes, uh, city serving facilities, the National Works Yard, uh, the animal shelter, the emergency response, the fire halls, um, the park spaces, etc. Doug Shira is going to speak to us about the parks. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. While we're figuring that out, I'll just say I, I'm going to be very brief here. Thank you. Uh, I have two slides. I will mention that you'll see in your agenda that there is a parks and open space <coughs> session that's dedicated to those things on February 23rd. So we'll be back again then to speak in a little more detail. So I've just got two slides here. Uh, the first uh, outlines the parks that are impacted by the arterial options. There's three of them. The largest one uh, is in the middle, Stratacona Park, uh, which is 10 hectares or about 25 acres. Uh, as uh, John mentioned in his excellent uh, historical overview, it uh, uh, started as a park in 1947 on the uh, former uh, site of a garbage dump. Um, currently, it features all sorts of things, including soccer fields, uh, baseball and softball fields, basketball court, uh, playground, skate area, there's a field house with washrooms, uh, and of course, uh, a portion of the uh, Cottonwood Garden is located on the park, and uh, Strath at, uh, Strathcona Community Garden as well. Uh, the second park to the left, or the west, is Trillium Park which is three hectares, uh, or about eight acres. Uh, it's a newer park, it uh, was built in 2009 uh, with some improvements in 2010 and 2014. Uh, the, the most dominant uh, feature of that park is, of course, the synthetic sports fields, which are used for soccer, field hockey, and ultimate. Uh, there's also tree planting uh, areas, there's a washroom building, uh, and as well an environmental art and stewardship area uh, towards the north end of the park. The third park I'd like to mention briefly is Strathcona Linear Park, which you'll see is directly north of Strathcona Park. It's not actually physically impacted by any of the options that are being considered, but it is potentially uh, impacted by some of the options in terms of park connectivity, which is um, important because in an area that will have increasing density coming in uh, in the near future, um, Park access and connectivity between park spaces is super important. So uh, the idea that Strathcona and Strathcona Linear and McLean Park all sort of connect uh, is, is an important consideration. So these, uh, those, those three parks uh, are uh, really important features of people who live, work, and play in the Strathcona neighborhood. So uh, policies related to parks. Um, I'm actually going to, if I can just go to the slide, oops, you could just go to this slide. Before we get to man, uh, policies and mandate, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the key considerations uh, in terms of park planning in Strathcona. Um, and that, uh, to, to talk about that, I want to talk about park provision, which is a term that's in your um, glossary. Park provision is basically the way that the park board measures uh, 
uh, whether or not a new neighborhood is adequately served by park space. And um, for the last 25 years, we've had a working figure of about 1.1 hectares or 2.5 acres uh, per thousand uh, uh, residents. And so, uh, and that, again, you'll see that in your glossary. Strathcona neighborhood is underserved by that metric. Um, as are the adjacent neighborhoods, uh, downtown, Groundview, Woodlands, uh, Fairview, Mount Pleasant, they're all underserved. And of course, with population growth, uh, assuming no new parks uh, and understanding the difficulty of acquiring new park space, that uh, deficiency is only going to be exacerbated by uh, density coming in. Um, as the 14th largest park in the city, Strathcona Park is pretty important. We've got about 240 odd parks. Uh, and uh, most of them are quite small, um, Strathcona being one of the largest. So it offers a lot of um, uh, flexibility in terms of the, uh, the amenities that are there now, and imp importantly, it offers flexibility for uh, future, as yet unknown, service needs that the park board will have to uh, deliver. So now on to park board uh, mandate and policy. So as I, as I had mentioned uh, when I was up here answering a question, the park board is uh, an independently elected board. And I brought my little piece of paper up because I haven't memorized our mission, but the park board's mission is to provide, preserve, and advocate for parks and recreation services to benefit all people, communities, and the environment. And as I said, city and park board staff work very closely, collaborating all the time on a, on a variety of things. Um, and as I also mentioned, um, which we'll get into more on our park board day, uh, any changes to parks uh, that would be considered uh, as one, uh, un, uh, in considering these options, would first have to go to the park board for a decision and support before it can proceed to council for, uh, for, for a decision and support. And the park, pad, park board has its own engagement process that we go through uh, before we take things like this to our board for consideration. Uh, one of the main aspects of the Park Board's uh, 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 mandate is to adopt a principle of no net loss of park space. So I'm going to hurry up. So very quickly, um, if we lose park space, we want to acquire park space in the same uh, proportion and importantly, that has the potential to offer the same services that the land we're losing offers. Three really important policies that you want to consider. Van play, which is our Parks and Rec Services Master Plan. If you want to find out more about that, vancouver.ca slash van play. Uh, it's outlining our vision for Parks and Rec over the next 25 years. Uh, and there's an excellent, excellent uh, report on the current state of Parks and Rec. Read it, it's uh, really, really fascinating. The biodiversity strategy, uh, basically, uh, the mandate of the biodiversity strategy is to protect improve and expand natural areas in the city and increase access to nature, which our citizens have told us is really important. And lastly, the urban forest strategy, which is also a city of Vancouver policy, which seeks to uh, maintain and improve the urban forest canopy throughout the city, and that uh, applies to parkland, city land, and privately owned land. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.